So I think for me, what I talk to my clients about, the biggest difference is that Pitocin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. Um, And for bonding, and I mean, really for lots of um, things that happen inside of our body after the baby, that is a big, big deal. Another thing that I talk to my clients about is uh, how using Pitocin at all during your labor increases Mm -hmm. your risk of postpartum depression by about 30%. Hi, I'm Rachel, owner of the Natural Birth Site, certified birth doula, childbirth educator, and midwife's assistant. And I'm Tiffany Muniz, certified birth doula, lactation counselor, and midwife assistant. Here, you'll learn all about different aspects of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Remember, none of this information should take the place of your care provider and is not medical advice. Birth is not a medical emergency. Thanks for listening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Natural Birth Talk. This is Tiffany. And this is Rachel. Today, we have a very special guest, Corinne Brown. Corinne, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Corinne Brown. I'm the creator of the Love Your Labor program. And I am a former naturopathic doctor and a mom of three and the author of The Bad Birth Goddess. So this is my jam. Talking about natural birth is absolutely my favorite thing. So thanks so much, guys, for having me on. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So actually, Rachel, do you want to talk to her? Because I can't even remember anything that you just said about what we're talking about. <laughs> That's fine. I will be, I'd be happy to. So Sorry. Today, I really want to talk about, you had made a couple posts recently that are topics that I just love to talk about. And I know Tiffany loves to talk about one of them being kind of that seven plus centimeter time in your birthing time. Which, which is also often referred to as transition and how that is the most important time to really like know your strength as a woman and as a birthing mom who's, you know, about to bring life into this world. So I want to talk about that. And then I also want to tie that into Pitocin and Oxytocin and how they are different and how they affect your birthing time as a whole. So nice. Kind of what I want to talk about. So let's start with though. Let's start with maybe talking about what labor can look like when kind of that transition time happens, because I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there that aren't even familiar with what transition means or what like seven plus centimeters dilation, what that really means. So kind of give an overview of what all that means. Yeah, I love that. And I think that that is like a critical piece of labor and birth, right? Mm -hmm. women are pregnant for such a short amount of time. And in that time, there is a lot of learning that has to happen. It's so very important to understand the different stages of labor, what you can expect at the different times and what your body is actually designed to do. So one of the things that I teach on a lot, I have three kind of core main teachings, the labor funnel, the birth matrix and the birth blueprint. So the birth blueprint is really like your hormonal physiology or reproductive physiology that you are divinely hardwired with. And so it's just the same as, you know, you, you've gone through your, your menstrual cycle, you've ovulated, you've conceived this baby, you've grown this baby, all the different cells, mm-hmm. all the different organs, everything perfectly placed that is just all part of the reproductive blueprint. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. but then when it gets to birth, everyone throws up their hands and says, Oh my God, the body doesn't know what it's doing. We need the doctors, right. Mm -hmm. Which is where the birth matrix and the labor funnel come in, but the birth blueprint, if we can protect it, Mm -hmm. if we can avoid the, all the medical interventions and we can advocate for ourselves and we can stand up for our natural birth. And we can trust our body to birth this baby. Like we trusted it to grow the baby. Oh yeah, exactly. It's all just a continuation. (laughs) Then we will actually allow this birth blueprint to unfold like a beautiful flower, right? It just like it flows and that's the way it's designed to. And so transition specifically what you're speaking about, right? There's, there's early labor, which is like, you know, zero to four ish centimeters. And there's active labor, which is five ish to seven ish centimeters. And then when you hit the seven, eight centimeter mark, (laughs) And this is Mm -hmm. so important to know and to Mm. cling to this and to tell your partner this and tell your doula this and tell everybody this, that when you get to that seven, eight centimeter mark, that is transition. And that's where every single woman utters the exact same phrase. No matter how many babies she's had. (laughs) Yeah, right. Exactly. It's like, it falls out of your mouth. I can't do this anymore. You've hit a wall and you're just like, this is beyond the beyond. I'm done. Where Mm -hmm. is the epidural? Right. Are the drugs. And when you're in the hospital, 
that's where the medical system says, all right, here we go. Let's let's do it. it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Nobody says "Ah, ah, you can do this. Yes. This is the hardest part, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody encourages and, and gives you that support, but mother nature does. So in the birth blueprint, there's this beautiful thing called labor land, right? Mm -hmm. Where we kind of fall into, I say, it's like a dark curtain gets pulled around you, a dark velvet curtain, and you don't really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you're falling asleep. You're falling asleep in between the waves. That's another thing I always hear is I'm just so tired. I just need some rest. Maybe I should get some meds. Mm. Or when they talk about their previous births. I was just so tired. I was exhausted. I was falling asleep in between my contractions. Like I had to get an epidural. I had to. (laughs) No matter how fast or how short, how long your labor is, you fall asleep in between contractions. You hit that labor land. That's the name of the game. And then baby's on your chest and you're right away, wide awake. And it's like crazy. And it's all hormonally perfectly designed Mm -hmm. to be that way. And it's all for a reason. And Mm -hmm. so understanding that, oh, I've hit this mark where I can't do it anymore. Suddenly you're just like totally groggy or dissociated. You're Mm -hmm. in your own zone. You're doing your thing. You have no idea people are talking to you or what's going on. And you're not talking. You're like Uh one grunt for yes, two grunts for no. (laughs) 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 Like you're not speaking sentences at this point. You are so dialed in. Uh You are so focused. And that's again, the way it's designed to be. Mm-hmm. Cause it is the hardest part, mm-hmm. right? It is. And so mother nature says, Shh, I got you. Don't worry. We'll get through this. Like, just I'll take it from here kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then you get fully dilated and then you get the adrenaline and then you're like, okay, let's push this baby out. You wake up like as uh-huh. if you were just you know, passed yeah. out of the party kind of thing, ready to rally. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that's again, the way it's designed to be. Yeah. And so just like understanding that, mm-hmm. like from Mm -hmm. the 10,000 foot view or whatever, that Mm -hmm. it's actually beautifully created that way. And that we don't need to jump in with all these medical interventions. You don't need to be saved Mm -hmm. from it. It's so important. I feel like I have this conversation with all of my clients at the end Uh of their pregnancy. You know, most, a lot of my clients at least get very discouraged at the end. They feel like they're going to be pregnant forever. And I always just Mm -hmm. try to reiterate, like you guys, you conceive this baby on your own. You've grown this baby from literally two cells. Like Mm -hmm. why would your body do all of this work and know exactly what to do? And then just forget how to work. Like it just, it, it, it doesn't work that way. Exactly. Um, I I do give a little bit of grace for moms who have like conceived via like IVF or who have needed extra help because, you know, they do just kind of have a bit of a different mental state Mm -hmm. about things because they needed help Mm -hmm. to conceive and grow the baby. So, you know, I do kind of understand when they struggle to, uh, to understand the birth process. But with that being said, I have had several IVF clients have a baby with zero intervention still and their Mm -hmm. body, even though they needed help to grow that baby, their body still knew how to birth that baby. Mm -hmm. So it's like, no matter where your pregnancy came from, your body knows how to birth your baby. And sometimes it knows how to birth your baby in seven hours. And sometimes it knows how to birth your baby in 70 hours, (laughs) Yeah, but it knows how to birth your baby. Yeah. Yeah. And having that, that faith, just that trust that, Mm -hmm. and like in the, the reel that you were speaking about, where I talk about knowing your strength Mm -hmm. in that seven centimeter mark, um, you know, ideally having your partner on the same page so your partner can remind Mm -hmm. you of your strength at that moment. Yes. But a big thing for me was, cause I had long labors and I had a short labor. My Mm -hmm. last one was just super, super short. And, um, and your last one was your home birth, wasn't it? Yeah. And I think crazy how that works. I know. (laughs) I know. Um, but yeah, just like, just having that belief in yourself, you know, I would always tell myself like, this isn't going to kill me. I can Mm -hmm. do, Mm -hmm. I can go all the way to the end of the earth for this. I'm not going to die. This is literally just a sensation. It's mind over matter. And when you understand understand that blueprint and you understand the physiology of it, Mm -hmm. then you're not afraid of it. You're Mm -hmm. totally way more well open to welcome it in. And that's Mm -hmm. really what's going to allow it to be so much more efficient. So just being like, no, I got this. Yeah, it is hard. It is going to be the hardest thing I ever do. My partner's reminding me that I'm doing it, that I'm on, you know, like that I'm on the right track. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really the key. I think it's just not mm-hmm. being like, I'm going to give up now. Cause it's hard. Agreed. Yeah. Gotta, yeah. 
And so much of that is, like you said, it's mental preparation during the birth itself. Because like you said at the beginning, there's so much to learn when you get pregnant, which really sucks because Mm -hmm. we used to grow up around pregnancy and birth and we used to just know it because we saw Mm -hmm. it and we experienced it through other women. And now we're like, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant. What do I do? And we have to really spend so much time learning about it. Mm -hmm. And then we have to almost relearn how to trust our body because our culture is like, you can't trust anything. Trust the doctors. You can't trust yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's a complete relearning and a, a complete mental shift from what so many of us are used to. And then on top of that, you're not just learning about birth, but you're learning how to make it through. And that mental preparation, again, just reminding yourself this doesn't last forever and yeah a three-day labor is a really long labor but in comparison to your entire life it's just three days Mm. you've been sick for longer than three days yeah (laughs) Uh you know you and it's it's just so important to remember that another thing I wanted to say too is that you don't have to know your seven centimeters we keep saying that seven plus centimeter mark but there you don't have to know when you hit certain centimeters Mm -hmm. you just you feel it in your body. And like as doulas, like Tiffany and I, and even Corinne, you've doulaed before, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. We can tell when you've hit that transition. Yeah. You don't need a cervical we, check. Right. Nobody has to say, Hey, you're seven <laughs> centimeters. You've hit that mark. We're like, okay, you've hit that transition mark. For me, I start transitioning at like four or five centimeters with all of my babies. Mm. And I go from four to five centimeters to having a baby within just a couple hours. Yeah. And so it's even not an exact science as far as like centimeters and stuff. So I just want to throw exactly. that out there for women to understand, like your cervix is not a crystal ball. It does not tell you when you're going to give birth, listen to your body and even surrender. You hit that transition and it's a lot of surrendering just to Huge. the process. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, there's, that's key. there's my little mashed up rant about transition <laughs> and centimeters and all of that. I, I do want to go back to what you were saying about how we have to relearn and what society mm. says about birth. So that is what I refer to as the birth matrix. And that's kind of like the societal subconscious programming, like from mm-hmm. the time where we are little girls, we are shown that very traditional hospital birth scene. Mm-hmm. We all know the one, yeah. you know, where she's running down the hall or being wheeled down the hall, her legs in the air, she's screaming, she's sweating, she's freaking out at her partner, give me the mm-hmm. drugs, you know, all the things. We've seen that so many times we could say it with our eyes closed. Mm-hmm. That doesn't even make sense. But you know what I mean? It's programmed yeah. into us. And mm-hmm. that is, I think, all kind of shuffling us along into the hospital system and into the mm-hmm. labor funnel. And the labor mm-hmm. funnel is just the domino effect of medical interventions in hospital mm-hmm. that begins with Pitocin. Yes. And so really a lot of the preparation, yes, it's learning about the, the blueprint, but it's also learning about what are they trying to do in the hospital? What are their intentions? What mm-hmm. is their plan for my birth and yeah. how to maneuver within that? Uh huh. Right. And you know what? Some of us are screaming and yelling at our partners with our legs up and asking <laughs> for drugs and we're still making it. And, you yeah. know, I've had so many moms go through natural birth where they are screaming and yelling at people and they are talking oh, yeah, about drugs, amazing. but they yeah. still make it through that natural birth. So it's not completely yeah. unrealistic, but it is kind of that programming of that. It happens in the hospital. It happens when you see it. There's like so much duress. Yeah, that it's yeah. a scary Traumatic, it's always an emergency. Medical. Yeah. Always an emergency. Yeah. And birth is not a medical emergency, right? Yeah. 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 And it's always like, go to the hospital. It's never like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, we're going to labor at home or we're going to deliver at home. It's like yeah. immediately rushed to the hospital because I don't know what to do. We don't know what yeah. to do. They know right. what to do. And it's just very disempowering. So it's been this like lifelong process of separating us from our mm-hmm. birth blueprint, our innate mm-hmm. like maternal instinct, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And one of these days I need to have an episode about how birth ended up in the hospital in the first place, because that, if you can understand how birth ended up in the hospital, then you can easily see why it doesn't belong in the hospital anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But I won't get into that right now. So you said, you know, it starts with Pitocin, you know, Mm -hmm. that's where that birth funnel, as you refer to it, it, you know, that cascade of interventions, it starts with Pitocin starts with Pitocin. It doesn't even always start with Pitocin. It may start with an NST, a Mm non-stress test. Mm -hmm. Um, It may start at the end of your pregnancy. Yes. 
uh-huh, those are the obstacles. Scan. Exactly. Right. There's all these like, may, little tripping points. It may no. start with a slightly elevated blood pressure. That's not mm-hmm. really dangerous, but someone mm-hmm. saw that it went up a little bit. So they want to mm-hmm. have you just sent in, you know, that's yeah. kind of where it can start. And then sometimes it starts with cervical ripening meds, but really so often, even if it doesn't start with Pitocin, it ends with Pitocin in some form. Mm-hmm. Usually. Right. And just for the listeners out there, Pitocin is the synthetic or lab created version of oxytocin. Oxytocin is your hormone, your natural hormone that you need to have a baby. It's it's to have contractions. It's your contraction hormone. It's also considered or called your love hormone because it helps with bonding and it it's uh, produced during intimacy and things like that. So that's what oxytocin is. Pitocin which even on the bag, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but like, I'm sure you have, I have even yeah. on the bag in the hospital, the bag, when they put it up to hang, it doesn't say Pitocin. It says oxytocin, Yeah, mm-hmm. but That's it's not huge, like, yeah, yeah need it's, to know that. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not oxytocin. It is man-made Pitocin. Um, do you guys want to talk about the differences between Pitocin and oxytocin? Do you want to go ahead? To me? Oh, do I want to go ahead? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between Pitocin and oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, obviously like oxytocin is made inside of your body. Pitocin is made, um, usually in a lab and for our body, there is a big difference there. So I think for me, what I talk to my clients about the biggest difference is that Pitocin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. Um, and for bonding, and I mean, really for lots of, um, things that happen inside of our body after the baby, that is a big, big deal. Another thing that I talk to my clients about is uh, how using Pitocin at all during your labor increases Mm -hmm. your risk of postpartum depression by about 30%. Obviously, oxytocin that we make in our own body doesn't do that at all. It actually does the opposite, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right. Um, Which helps protect us against those things. And that's, you know, obviously one of its biggest roles. And I think personally, why so many women struggle with postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety, you know, after they have their baby. Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. Yeah. And because it blocks the oxytocin and the endorphins, it doesn't allow you into labor land, which we were talking about Mm -hmm. or ecstatic birth. So if you've got a medicated labor happening, Mm -hmm. ecstatic birth is not in the cards, right? Because So much of the ecstasy is the oxytocin and the endorphins, which it's blocking. So it's like, if women knew that they would, it it would just totally reframe it. Right. And it would just be like, do I really want to, to introduce this when my Mm -hmm. body's actually making something so much better naturally on its own, you know? Well, and you guys, you vaguely mentioned that you know, one of you said Pitocin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. And the other one said it doesn't really release endorphins. And I just want to put those things together. Yes, exactly. So because (laughs) Pitocin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, it doesn't trigger endorphin release. But Mm. when your natural oxytocin happens and flows through your body, it does cross that blood brain barrier and it does trigger endorphin release and endorphins make you happy. Yeah. They help you cope with the intensity of labor better. Yeah. Um, they're, yeah. and they help with postpartum bonding. They help with that energy postpartum. They help with just feeling better postpartum. And that's the theory mm-hmm. as to why Pitocin causes, increases the risk of postpartum depression. The theory is that it's because you don't get that endorphin release. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then guys, Pitocin contractions just suck. Much harder. Yeah. Much they're more intense. Night and day. And they the want, ones that your body can produce. Yep. Yep. They're much more intense because you're not getting that endorphin release. Right. Because your body cannot self-regulate the amount of Pitocin, but it does self-regulate the oxytocin. Mm-hmm. And then uh, what else was I just going to say? When you go in, Corinne, when you go in for a Pitocin induction, what's like the frame that they want your contractions to be at? Like I, I didn't ask that eloquently. I'll just say it. Okay. So when you go in for just a Pitocin production, <laughs> induction- <laughs> They want your contractions, your waves to be two to three minutes apart from the very beginning, right? Oh, okay. So I see what you mean. So the I know I didn't ask that, that. Well, I'll probably edit that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's a good point because it, yeah. or, I mean, obviously we don't know how each person's body is going to react to a mm-hmm. specific dose of Pitocin. So one woman may only need 
uh, you know, the Pitocin on a level two in order mm-hmm. to get that, what they call an effective labor pattern. Mm-hmm. Whereas another woman might need something like a 20 to mm-hmm. get that effective labor pattern. So I think, is that what you were trying to say, Rachel? Like well, kind how- of, yeah. So how much Pitocin is in your body and then how quickly they want your waves two to three minutes apart, you know, in a, yeah. in a natural labor Corinne, like kind of, why don't you talk about how contractions kind of progress usually throughout labor? Now, all yeah. labors are different. Your body can't read right. a textbook. Yeah. But why don't you yeah, talk totally. about how like in a natural labor, your body kind of slowly progresses and how, what contractions may look like, and then compare that to how that often looks like in a Pitocin induced labor. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, in, in early labor, it's pretty hit and miss, right? They can mm-hmm. be two minutes, 20 minutes, 12 minutes here, there, they can be 30 seconds long. Usually they are under a minute and they're usually Mm -hmm. early labor. You're walking through them. You're talking through them. You're totally able to just kind of, I recommend people just kind of go about their day. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas once active labor hits, these contractions are a full minute long. You cannot walk, you cannot talk. You're much more focused. Mm -hmm. They're coming more consistently three, four, five minutes apart, Mm -hmm. right? That's how you, that's that first kind of shift where you Mm -hmm. can say, okay, I see the pattern changing here. We're into active labor transition kind of starts. And this is why labor land is created. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Transition starts to, you know, you might get back to back contractions. You might Mm -hmm. get two minute long contractions or a minute and a half, right? You might, they might be significantly more intense. Well, they will be more intense. And so Mm -hmm. that's where, you know, that now you're into transition. Mm -hmm. And then once you hit fully, fully dilation, your, your adrenaline spikes, right? Then Mm -hmm. you're getting the contractions are coming consistently, but they're not the way that they were typically in Mm -hmm. transition. You're Mm -hmm. getting a little bit of a break in between the, the good, strong urges to push. Um, so that's kind of the, but then if you're going into the hospital and you're two centimeters dilated Mm -hmm. or three centimeters, and they want you to be back to back two, three minutes apart, you see Mm -hmm. how that's not natural, right? You see that's not the normal pattern. And so that's why women have these very kind of long, difficult, labors that need more interventions. And it's just, right. mm-hmm. and in natural transition, your waves are kind of two to three minutes apart, right on top of each other, two minutes long, but that transition period, and this is something important that we haven't said yet mm, is usually true. quite short. Yeah. Yeah. And close. it is usually quite short, yeah. especially when your baby's in a good position and you've been doing lots of movement and exercise throughout pregnancy and you're able to just trust your body and you've naturally gotten to transition that two to three minutes apart is usually quite short. But if you're having a Pitocin induced labor, then you hit that two to three minute apart, you know, those contractions are two to three minutes apart from the very beginning. So it may be mm-hmm. 20 hours or more, very more, realistically yeah. mm-hmm. of those waves so close together. So of course you're going to be more tired. Of course, they're going to feel more intense. Of course, you're going to feel like you need some sort of medical pain relief, mm-hmm. yeah. but if you're able to just let your natural oxytocin flow and you're able to just trust your body and you get to that transition point where you do feel like you can't do this, but by time, by time you're just done with it, but by time you're just like, uh, uh-uh, this has been too long. You're pushing. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. If you can just get like a little nudge of support through it, it's, you're just onto the next phase. It's just it's like the ring of fire. Essentially. It's like transition is like that. It's like, Mm -hmm. Oh, just, just power through because right Mm -hmm. on the other side of that Mm -hmm. is, is relief. Right. Right. Absolutely. So I have to tell my first birth story because it fits this so well. I, I, it does not include Pitocin or oxytocin, but it does include that moment of transition where I, I thought I knew a lot about birth and then I got into the birth and I was like, I don't know anything. Um, (laughs) And I hit, I hit, I very quickly hit transition. So I went into the hospital at like 6 PM and I was like only two centimeters dilated. I had been laboring most of the day, but it wasn't necessarily hard. I'd been laboring at home and I got to the hospital like 6 PM. I was two centimeters dilated. They didn't even admit me right away. They were like, okay, well, your midwife's going to come in in like two hours when she's done with her meeting to check you. Two hours later, I was four centimeters dilated. So this is like, what? eight o'clock at night, eight 30. I didn't know at the time. So I let her break my water. She didn't make me, she offered. And I said, sure. I did not do that with any of my other, uh, labors just in case anybody was wondering, but (laughs) I, and then I was told, so I 
was told I instantly hit five centimeters when she broke my water. And then I was told an hour per centimeter and an hour of pushing, which is super old school textbook way of thinking about labor that is completely inaccurate. Completely. Um, Some birds do go that way, but, but most do not. So I'm thinking I have six hours of this left. And then when my water broke, I hit like a brick wall. It was like, I was sweating. I went from being cold to sweating Mm -hmm. and I was miserable. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, my midwife left and went home. So I asked for about an hour into that. I was like, I cannot do this for another five hours. I need an epidural. And, um, I got the IV fluids because they put IV fluids in you before you get an epidural to help your blood pressure. I got the IV fluids and just the IV fluids made me feel a lot better because I wasn't so hot anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like 20 minutes later, I remember like, I didn't know what pushing was, but I was like grunting and the nurse had this look of panic on her face. And she's like, (laughs) just blow it away. Your midwife's coming back. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're saying to me. Yeah, right. And um, my midwife came back and I was like, where is my epidural? And they're like, oh, you're not getting one. And I was like, What? You know, so I, I say all that to say, so I was in that transition. I had been told I had five to six hours left. In reality, I birthed my baby less than three hours after she broke my water. So I was five Mm -hmm. centimeters. And then within three hours, I had birthed my baby. Yeah. And I think that is so important for people to understand how it is very intense. Had I known it was only going to be three hours and not six, had I been more aware of how birth actually works? I don't think I would have ever asked for that epidural. And I'm so grateful that I didn't get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it just comes back to that knowledge of what transition is and knowing your strength Mm -hmm. and knowing that you can power through this. Yeah. And your birth team knowing that same information. Yes. Mm -hmm. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. And I, such a good point too, about how you were like, oh my God, five hours left. And then your mindset of like, can I do this? Can I cope? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Like, that is a really good argument for not doing cervical checks or, yes. you know, not yeah. worrying about time. Because I remember too, when I was in my first birth and I was not dilating, not di- dilating, I was trying for a breech vaginal delivery. And I was, I was just like, so focused. I was like, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And then the OB goes, you know what? Like the old OB who was going to support mm-hmm. me went off mm-hmm. and a new OB came on. He goes, we're done. And immediately I could not cope. I was, I felt like there was an elephant on my chest. I was like, I can't Uh do this. Like as soon as he said, you are not able to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. All the coping went out the window. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Hey, just like, get me through, like, get me to the C-section or whatever it is we're doing Mm -hmm. because all of my resolve was gone. And that's just like such a key, you know, reminder that so much of it is in our mindset. So much Mm -hmm. of it is in our head that it is mind over matter. And as soon as you get the slightest little bit of discouragement, it can really impact your ability to cope. That's so true. And how much our environment plays into that? How much, I mean, just one little tiny change in our environment can totally derail our plan. Which is why we're such huge advocates for home birth. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) <laughs> because your environment I mean, makes a difference. Your mental space makes a difference. And so many providers out there have no care for your mental space. Yeah. They don't think it matters. They, they care about understand. A, the baby in the bassinet, like after it's born, like uh, getting the baby here and the baby being alive and the mom being alive. That's, yeah. you know, for the most part, in my experience, yep. what most of them care about. Which is important, yeah. right? It's important yeah. to have both of them alive. Well, sure, but, but there are that's other happen, things you know? that are also very important when Absolutely. it comes to her. So that are yeah. just as important. Absolutely. Yep. And you do you just gotta trust your body. Yeah. You just gotta trust your body. And then one last thing that I wanna add, and then you guys can add anything, is that if you do have to have Pitocin, that does not mean your natural birth plan has to go out the window. It means you're going to have to cope differently. It means it's going to be harder. It means you should definitely hire a doula if you haven't yet. It means you have to be really open to to just communication with the people in the room. It means you have to really pull and rely on those birth affirmations. So it doesn't mean your natural birth has to go out the window. It means it's going to be harder, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to completely go out the window. You can still do this pain med free if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Just just absolutely like make sure you've got options for pain management. Like I don't like to harp on any one particular style, but I do 
in fun pick on hypnobirthing a little bit because I'm just like, I, there, there are times where transit, where contractions change their quality. And sometimes if you only have one coping mechanism, Mm -hmm. it will Mm -hmm. fail you. And then you're like, well, I got nothing to fall back on. It's really important to just like shore yeah. up lots of options for lots them. of yeah. options and yep. natural options. Anyway, water, but, yeah. water is huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yes. for any type of birth, water is huge pool or shower or tub, shower, whatever. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of hospitals now, I don't know about in Canada, but in America, a lot more starting to offer nitrous oxide. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very common in Europe, I know, but we're, you know, kind of behind there. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of. um then there's you know there's all other kinds of things there's physical comfort measures and again those mental comfort measures we keep talking about and essential oils and there you know I agree like with Corinne you have to have kind of several things stored up yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and I think for uh for like the mental comfort measures really making sure that you're taking time to practice those during your pregnancy. I think a lot of people think, you know what, it's fine. I'm just going to wing it. And like, Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go with the flow and like, it's going to be great. But in reality, unfortunately, that's not how it works. Just Mm -hmm. like, you know, some of those physical comfort measures, even I think more so the the mental ones Mm -hmm. are the ones that you really have to practice. Um, yeah. So, cause you have to believe it. Right. I mean, you're literally like changing pathways in your brain, you know, whenever you are practicing these during your pregnancy. So it's really, really important because if you're in labor and you're already super tense and super stressed out, uh, Mm -hmm. those comfort measures, those uh, uh, mental comfort measures probably aren't going to help you near as much um, as if you would have practiced them during pregnancy. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. Don't, don't wing it ever. No, <laughs> I'm like, Never. don't ever try to wing your birth. You, yeah. You there are very few people prepared. in this world. I know. When people very are like, people I'm in this world so laid back. I'm so laid back. I'm just going to go see how it goes. No, that's like the worst thing you could <laughs> <Right>? do. <laughs> yeah. You're going to go with the flow of Pitocin through your veins. You're going to go with the you're flow gonna go. <laughs> the labor funnel. <laughs> yeah. No, don't do that. Don't be a go with the flow person when it comes to birthing your baby, please. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Anything else you guys want to add before we finish up? No, I don't think so. That's good. All right. We'll chat. Yeah. I think this is going to be so helpful because again, I mean, I told my personal story, like had I known what transition was with my first baby, I think mm-hmm. things would have, I would have been so much less stressed during my birth, you know? Yeah. And so I think it's so important to understand what transition is and then to understand how the most common intervention affects labors. So Pitocin, how that affects things. So yeah. Uh, All right. Some- if, if you guys have any questions, listeners, just go ahead and email me at contact at the natural birth site.com and definitely check out the description below because I'm going to put some of Corinne's infos. Oh my goodness. Words. I'm going to put <laughs> some of Corinne's info in the description below. So make sure you check that out and thanks for listening guys. We'll talk to you in the next episode. Bye. Bye, guys. Hi, Rachel Manns again. If you want to learn more, please subscribe to and rate this podcast and head over to thenaturalbirthsite.com to check out our online natural birth education course, birth story blog, YouTube channel, and more.